Now we've got the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. Thanks so much for coming back on. Good to be with you again. So I want to start off with a clip of a Fox host taking aim at you in the aftermath of flight cancellations and the collapse of a section of I-95. Here's that clip. We've seen at Christmas thousands of flights that were canceled and delayed. We see the railroad derailments that are happening on a constant basis. And then, of course, what's happening most recently. Look what happened in Philadelphia. The roads have collapsed. And that's because you have a a transportation secretary that has little to no experience in what he's doing and understanding the nation's infrastructure when it comes to transportation. And so until we have effective leadership, who, you know, someone that understands the importance of strategic planning and collaborating with the states and the communities and understanding their needs, then we're going to continue to see these catastrophic events. Yeah. Can I have your response to this idea that you are now somehow unilaterally to blame for I-95 collapsing? And, and when you were deciding which highway to destroy, what made you choose that one in particular? I mean, some people seem determined to make literally anything into a partisan attack. But, you know, if you look at I-95 and the response to it, and of course, it wasn't caused by any policymaker. It was caused by a a terrible, tragic, fatal, fiery crash, which melted the structural steel. Uh, But but the other really important thing about the story of I-95 is how quickly it was reconstructed because we worked so closely with the Pennsylvania DOT under the leadership of the governor of Pennsylvania because we made sure they had the funds that they needed uh, because there was such great coordination. uh, That was re opened in record time with really innovative approaches and solutions. And that's what we're trying to do across the board. Uh, Look, if we really want to talk about uh, transportation, let's talk about results. Uh, Same thing with the airlines, where one year ago, even when the weather was perfect, we were seeing huge amounts of cancellations and delays. We've seen dramatic improvement in the performance uh, of the system since then. Still a long way to go, but a huge improvement and importantly, a huge improvement in passenger rights because of the commitments and uh, uh, passenger protections that our department secured. So look, in area after area after area, I can point to the work that we've done, the results we have to show for it. And I just think it's strange and unfortunate when somebody wants to uh, you know, make, make some kind of political attack out of these things happening in transportation. The other thing I would note is that you know, we have launched or funded over 30,000 transportation projects. Just week this week alone, it was in eastern Kentucky in an Appalachian community that Uh, lost dozens of people to flooding. We're doing a highway project that's also going to improve the dam there and make them more resilient to future floods. We're in Orangeburg, South Carolina, Lexington, Kentucky, all very different communities, all benefiting from the funding. Uh, I never see these kinds of projects covered on Fox News. But the moment uh, some something problematic strikes the transportation system, uh, you have a commentator who's ready to try to turn it into a political attack. I don't think that's how most people think about their transportation systems. I think most people want problem solving. And that's exactly what we're doing every day. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's worth noting, too, that the irony here is that she's blaming you for the state of our roads and airports and railroads when that is quite literally what the infrastructure package was passed to do. And by the way, most Republicans voted against it. So you have these Republican mouthpieces who want to have their cake and eat it too, basically. They want to blame you for the state of the roads, all the while having tried to ensure that those same roads wouldn't actually get fixed at the end of the day. Yeah, it's been remarkable to see uh, a lot of uh, frequently Republican members of Congress, sometimes in the Senate, too, who voted no on the infrastructure package, showing up to either criticize when something goes wrong or to celebrate when we are delivering funding uh, to these communities. Uh, Just the other day, uh, my department sent uh, funds to a South Carolina community to improve their transit. And there was a member of Congress there who attacked the funding, attacked the bill, attacked the package, but was there to celebrate uh, the funding when it came to her community. And I think that just shows that at the end of the day, this really is good policy. Look, the sign of a bad policy is the people who supported it uh, wind up changing their minds later and running away from it. And by the same token, I I think the sign of a good policy is even the people who voted no try to come back and take some credit for it when it's yielding all those benefits in their communities. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, you... You may not name them, but it's Nancy Mace, John Cornyn, uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know other other Republicans like that. Um, now, as far as I ninety five is concerned, I want to stay on this for one more moment. the The speed with which that project was completed was pretty mind boggling for an American infrastructure project. So, how did we shorten that window from months to just days? And and what was the innovation here? 
So uh, the specific innovation had to do with using a material that uh, looks and feels like a kind of unusually light stone, but is actually made out of recycled glass. Uh, the Pennsylvania DOT was familiar with this, with this because they'd worked with it uh, in a few other contexts and realized with uh, uh, support and help from the funding we were able to provide that this could be used to create a temporary fill that would allow them to restore about two thirds of the traffic flow on I-95 while doing the permanent fix, which will take a longer period of time. But there's a period when we thought there would be no service on I-95 for uh, potentially months. So this is what happens when you try to clear the way for innovative solutions while still holding a very high bar on safety. And I think that coordination, that collaboration is an important lesson as we look to some of the uh, even bigger and more challenging projects that we have ahead, the tunnels that we're rebuilding, the bridges that we're replacing, the uh, airport terminals that we're renovating, all of which are, are circumstances is where we need to uh, beat the, the normal pattern of big infrastructure projects in America uh, for decades now, taking too long and costing too much. Well, that's my exact question. Is this going to have any discernible impact on infrastructure projects moving forward? Is there any way that we can use the innovations or, or the, the techniques that we used in, in PA to then you know, speed up other infrastructure projects across the country? I think there is that potential. Look, every single project, every single event that goes well is a learning opportunity. Same with anything that goes poorly. And so we're gathering data, working to take lessons learned, both from historical and, and, and recent experiences of projects that did take too long and cost too much, and the, those more rare events where a project comes in ahead of schedule or under budget. We saw that with a lot of airport work that was done in the last few years as well. So we're trying to apply those lessons because, look, we're taking a huge amount of funding out into these communities to build these projects. If you can make it even 1%, 2%, 3% quicker or more efficient, uh, if you add that up across the, the, the whole set of things we're doing, that's billions of dollars, which is that many more projects you could do with the money that you save. So we're very focused. You know, the year one, we were very focused just on getting the bill passed and getting the funding authorized. Now we're very, very focused on delivery and doing it efficiently, doing it right, because we, we may not get a chance like this again. I know a lot of the funding for the infrastructure project is going going toward fixes for existing issues like the one that we saw on I-95. But are there is there any funding being allocated to projects that are entirely new, entirely innovative? There is. Look, a lot of what we have to do is to repair the infrastructure we've inherited. There's a, a, a tunnel I was at with the president recently near Baltimore that's uh, over 150 years old. Uh, I was uh, the, the project that we were celebrating in Lexington this week, uh, 86, I think, years old. And this is just a lot of areas like that that need repair. But this isn't just about fixing what we have. We're trying to make sure there are new opportunities as well, including the potential of introducing true high speed rail on American soil oil for the first time. Uh, this is not something that's going to happen overnight, and we don't have the funding to create a national network right away. But there are several projects showing a lot of promise that we may be able to fund for the first time with the, the dollars that are in this infrastructure bill. You know, just recently, I was in Japan where we conducted the G7 meeting of transportation ministers from the G7 countries. And of course, I took the opportunity to uh, visit the control center of the famous bullet train there and, uh, and be on that train and see how they do that. Uh, it is extraordinary. It is remarkable. But it is also something that I believe that American citizens uh, deserve or ought to experience uh, that same kind of high-speed service uh, right here in an American way. And those are, are the kinds of things that are going to be possible that just weren't possible before because there wasn't even enough funding to keep up with what we have. Yeah. You know, I, I lived uh, for a couple of years in France and they have the TGV, the train à grande vitesse. Right. And you kind of go on that and you you realize what's possible. And, and, it, and there is this dichotomy because you have like American innovation and there's no reason that we wouldn't be able to create something like that here. But then you get here and you realize how difficult it is, you know, even with half the government that put up so many roadblocks to getting this infrastructure uh, bill passed. But the fact is that it does have such a discernible impact on people's lives. And I think, you know, with with what we're seeing right now in the infrastructure bill and uh, and and uh, broadband, which we're going to talk about shortly, it does come and impact your life, uh, life in a really big way. You know, this is all part of a broader economic message that the White House is calling Bidenomics, which is positioned basically as a foil to Reaganomics, which is this prevailing notion uh, for decades now among Republicans that the way to stimulate the economy is uh, for money to trickle down from the rich. 
Biden's approach is obviously different. It's that funding should go from the bottom up. So why is Biden right? And why is this Republican approach of trickle down wrong? Well, uh, you know, we know because we've seen the results. Uh, look, this Reaganomics concept, which really dominated uh, not just in Republican circles, but really seduced some Democrats uh, over the last 40 years as well, was the idea that if you just uh, uh, made sure you you slash taxes for corporations and the wealthy, uh, you absolutely minimized responsibilities and regulations, uh, the result would be economic growth for everybody. And instead, what you saw I would argue what you saw very predictably uh, was a widening income inequality, an economy that worked very well for the wealthiest, uh, but not so much for a lot of other people or not so much for a lot of other communities, including places in the industrial Midwest, like where I grew up in northern Indiana, that was largely left out of, uh, of that economic growth. Bidenomics is, as President Biden often says, about growing the economy, not from the top down, from the bottom up and from the middle out, having policies that favor work over wealth, uh, having policies that reward what working people contribute. It's why we're uh, so strong in being a pro-union administration. It's why we believe in good public investments like fixing roads and bridges and improving trains and transit and uh, enhancing ports and airports, because we know that when you make those good public investments, good private investment follows. I mean, we've seen hundreds of billions of dollars in private investment, much of it in those good paying manufacturing jobs, uh, just in the last couple of years since President Biden took office. And I think that reflects the fact that, uh, just to be clear, Bidenomics is uh, uh, far from being anti-business. It's actually good for business, but business on terms where working people and the middle class benefit the most. And we're going to keep pursuing that. Uh, that's the president's focus. It's how we approach everything from sustainability to transportation. Uh, make sure that it's working in a way that helps working people thrive. And by the way, we do have an example, like a pretty a pretty obvious example of how this Republican approach of trickle down economics doesn't work of, of tax cuts for uh, for the rich so that they could, you know, keep as much money as they can. And then that money will will uh, uh, purportedly trickle down um, in 2012. You know, I spoke about this on my on my uh, on my podcast a few weeks back, but in 2012 in Kansas, there was something called the Kansas experiment where Governor Sound, uh, Sam Brownback wanted to basically uh, use a condensed version of trickle down economics within the state. And sure. uh, and and they they passed it. They passed these these massive tax cuts and they were hoping that uh, it would just stimulate the economy. And what happened is within five years, uh, the economy was not only doing worse in that state than it was before. It was trailing all of their neighboring states. It was even trailing their own state's economy from before they implemented right. this plan. And uh, Sam Brownback ended up having the worst approval rating for any governor in the country. The Republican led legislature ultimately voted to overturn these uh, these tax cuts for the wealthy and impose uh, taxes instead. So we we have all of these all of these concrete examples of how trickle down doesn't work. And yet I think it, it really does go to show that the only reason that people stick with this idea is because the people who are passing this kind of legislation are really just pandering to uh, to the people who donate to their campaigns. Yeah, it's it's a great example. You know, we we don't believe in in uh, these economic principles because of our idealism. We believe in them also because of our experience. You look at the experience in Kansas. Uh, they experience, and this is a very conservative state which turned away from trickle-down economics and and Reaganomics because they experienced it in its purest form, and it was terrible. Let's move over to broadband. The White House just deployed $40 billion for rural broadband. This is going to disproportionately benefit rural America, and rural Americans disproportionately vote for Republicans. These are Republican voters. So why is it important that the White House work so hard to serve the people who are least likely to support you? Well, something we believe as an administration, certainly something President Biden has made clear, is that we have to serve every American, every community, red, blue, or purple, Democrat, Republican, independent. Uh, when you are in charge of the federal government, uh, you are in charge of benefiting every American. It's the approach we take with our transportation infrastructure spending. I just shared uh, some examples. I'll give you another one. We were in North Dakota uh, and uh, in Grand Forks celebrated uh, a railroad crossing that we're getting rid of. That they've been trying to do something about since the early 90s, uh, but they just didn't have the funds to, to work with to do that. We're doing that in, in communities, many of them rural communities around America. There's example after example, and broadband is one of the most powerful uh, examples. This is something that will lift up the entire country by lifting up these rural, largely rural areas that have been left out in the past. And I think it's truly historic. I think in the same way that 
the FDR is remembered for rural electrification when many parts of America, shockingly, did not even have access to electric power. I think President Biden's uh, administration and presidency will largely be remembered for bringing rural America online because uh, it's just as important today to, to thriving in this economy. And I also think, uh, just like a lot of people today probably scratch their heads uh, looking at the history books, thinking how could anybody have ever been against uh, rural electrification and how could any anybody have tried to stand in the way of FDR trying to do that with the New Deal? I think similarly, uh, future generations will be puzzled that anybody uh, would have voted no on the, uh, the the rural broadband funding that President Biden and this administration delivered. Yeah. Well, to that exact point, have you had any encounters with any of these, you know, Republican voters, staunch Republicans um, who have seen what the White House has been able to do for them with broadband, for example, and kind of voiced recognition for that? Well, let me tell you again, I was just in some very conservative areas, including a, a part of eastern Kentucky, which is a, a, a deep. No liberal in, bastion. Uh, yeah, not not known for uh, uh, you know urban liberal values, uh, and you know but the the thing is when I was there, we didn't talk about Republican Democrat. We did talk about delivering. We talked about you know getting that road fixed. We talked about getting that dam uh, repaired or replaced so that uh, they would not face the the same kind of lethal uh, threat from flooding uh, that they've experienced. And we talked about how that flooding is happening more and more frequently in this community. Now I didn't go around asking anybody how they were going to vote, but but what I could tell was that you had members of a community who weren't there for the politics. They were there for the results. They had teamed up to support each other when they went through these terrible floods. And they appreciated that they they had a governor who happens to be a Democrat, Andy Bashir, uh, and a, a president and an administration uh, who were there to make sure that, uh, that they get the support that they need. And again, that's the approach that we believe is the right one. It's always been said that good policy is good politics. It might sound naive, but I think in the end it works. And we're just going to keep getting out there trying to take care of people, not by checking who they voted for. Although, you know, we're also not going to be shy about occasionally reminding folks you know, who was with us and who was against us when we sought to get this infrastructure funding. And by the way, there were quite a few Republicans who crossed over the aisle in Congress and worked with Democrats and worked with President Biden and, and our team to get this thing done. It wasn't a majority, <laughs> but there were some. Uh, the exception that proves the rule, I think, in terms of the Senate Republicans and House Republicans who said, yes, of, of course, you can't be against better roads, bridges, broadband and more. We're, we're going to come with you on this. Yeah. And I should note, too, that it's not just these governors in the states like Andy Bashir and, uh, and and Shapiro in Pennsylvania who are making sure that some of this stuff happens. You know, it's also if you look at the dichotomy between the Democratic controlled Congress from 2020 to 2022, where they passed the CHIPS Act, the American Rescue Plan, the Inflation Reduction Act, the PACT Act, the first gun safety bill. I mean, you know, the list goes on and on. And those those achievements are are pretty black and white there versus the 2022 to 2024 Congress where it's uh, nonstop investigations into Hunter Biden and, uh, you know, maybe an effort to protect our gas stove. So I think the uh, the uh, the difference is right there in black and white. Um, I do want to switch over and finish off with uh, the recent spate of Supreme Court decisions. There's one in particular. The Supreme Court just handed down a ruling siding with a Christian web designer who refused to create uh, wedding websites for LGBT couples, effectively allowing a public business for the first time to discriminate against members of a protected class. Uh, what was your reaction to that ruling? Well, my big concern is that we seem to see the country retreating under this court from what had been a high watermark of rights and freedoms. I mean, every generation, uh, even though it's not been a perfect uh, progress or, or straight line, it remains true that in America, every generation has seen greater rights and freedoms and less discrimination than the generations that came before. And up until now, that was true with Supreme Court rulings. I mean, this uh, very week or, or, or month, uh, Chastin, my husband, and I have been celebrating uh, our fifth wedding anniversary, and uh, just not that many more than five years ago, getting married wasn't even an option. That's unthinkable to me now as we uh, make sure that our, our kids are ready for daycare every day. And, uh, you know, Chastin was at Target with the kids when, when he saw the news on his phone about this ruling. It's also an example of what we're seeing across the country, whether it's in the courts or in legislatures, about a, a solution in search of a problem. My understanding is this uh, this business hadn't even been approached by a same-sex couple asking them to produce a website for them. Uh, this, this case went forward on a hypothetical basis to try to establish a principle that you are 
permitted to discriminate in certain circumstances, provided you use religion as your excuse, because they wanted to uh, make sure that they chipped away at the non-discrimination that's been established by the court in recent years up until now. Just like you've got state legislatures across the country where the biggest issues those legislators are hearing about uh, are often about things like housing affordability, infrastructure, gun safety, health care, prescription drugs, and yet so many of them choose to spend their precious time and particular power on stuff like making life a little harder for queer high school kids, which the, the idea that that would be how you spend your energy and attention as, as somebody who has to make very tough decisions every day about which worthy projects we have to lay aside so that we can do even more worthy projects. I just don't understand how you would spend your scarce time and attention or your or, or your you know hard won power that people have trusted you with, whether you're a judge or, or, or whether you're an elected official on making life harder and making it easier to discriminate. Yeah, it is so crazy too how the same people who crow relentlessly about freedom had to conjure up not even a real example, but a hypothetical example of of you know a situation where they could then use that as a predicate to take more freedoms away from the LGBT community. Um, you know, you've been pretty outspoken about your faith and and you've pushed back against this idea that the right has a monopoly over religion in this country. Can you speak about how certain conservatives are weaponizing their religious beliefs as basically a tool, a, a political tool to wield against vulnerable communities? You know, the, the faith that I practice in a Christian tradition and the scripture that I read focuses on making yourself useful to the least among us. It talks about how salvation has to do with protecting the poor, with protecting protecting the oppressed, with welcoming the stranger. And there's a particular emphasis in the Christian tradition, and I think in, in most faith traditions, on looking out for those who have sometimes been ostracized or uh, marginalized and, and, and put upon by society, those who are in need of defense. And it's so different from what I see as some figures try to invoke religion as an excuse to make things even harder for those who are already on the margins to uh, to afflict the afflicted. I don't recognize my faith in that. And even more importantly, none of us should be out imposing our interpretation of our religion on anybody else. That's one of the most basic principles of our constitution and of our country. It's part of what makes America, America, the freedom to practice your faith and the freedom to go about your life knowing that uh, whatever faith, if any, you subscribe to, uh, that's not going to be held against you and somebody else's faith is not going to be imposed on you. Well, that was perfectly put as always. So Secretary Pete, thanks for the work you're doing. Thanks for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you. Good speaking with you.